So good afternoon and welcome to this MEF webinar in conjunction with CCS Insight. And today we're going to be looking at addressing the opportunity for the identity of things in growing the IoT ecosystem. So first of all, I would like to introduce Martin Garner and Martin will say a few words about himself and his organisation. Thank you very much, Andrew. So my name is Martin Garner. I uh, work for CCS Insight and I lead the research that we do in IoT. Uh, that's a very broad subject, so I tend to focus more on the industrial and enterprise use of IoT rather than on the consumer side. Um, just to introduce CCS Insight, we're a mid-sized analyst firm uh, based in the UK and in the US, uh, and we have uh, a, very, a large and broad blue chip client base around the world, uh, and we study uh, tech issues uh, for the connected world and look at how the market is developing in many, many areas across that landscape. Thank you, Martin. And I'm Andrew Parkin White. I'm MEF's advisor on mobile IoT. Well, my background is an, as an analyst, consultant, and strategist. And mobile IoT is one of MEF's work programs that also include enterprise communications, messaging, personal data, VAS, and advertising. So MEF operates through a series of working groups, knowledge sharing, and ecosystem interaction. And please contact us for more information about the coming part of the ongoing discussion. So within the IoT uh, working group, uh, we, we cover three main areas. One is IoT roaming, the second is IoT security, and the newest work stream is on the identity of things, which we're going to explore today. Today's webinar is going to run for about 45 minutes. It's been recorded and you'll be able to share it with colleagues through the email that will be sent after this session. We'll be writing up a blog with links to follow after the, uh, after the webinar. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A button. And this is for you to submit questions to myself and Martin during the course of the webinar, which we'll take at the end. So moving on to the, the content of today, um, digital personal identity has been a theme that sparked much debate in recent times, and it's becoming more widely understood as a result of the focus that ecosystems placed on it and also policy initiatives. Now, identity and access management has traditionally addressed the relationship between humans and devices, but with the dawn of IoT, it's now got to cover the relationship between these devices, so the identity of things. So this starts to raise quite a number of questions on how we allow billions of things to be identified, authorized, and securely connected. So Martin and I today will explore the issues, challenges, and opportunities arising from the identity of things, and look at what considerations an enterprise needs to take. And we're also going to focus on a number of key topics around identity, and those being zero touch, onboarding, and digital twins. So we'll come on to those later in the, the discussion. So I think as a, a good starting point is what is identity and why is it important? Martin, do you want to have a stab at that? Well, yeah. So um, in the past, uh, industrial machines were either standalone things or they were connected within the factory in a closed and private network and that applied to pretty much everything from uh, chemical processing plants right down to sort of door entry systems and simpler things like that now we're connecting those things to the corporate network and even to public networks and there are some new considerations and, and those really start with security and we had a great example just last week when it was announced that the hacker group had unveiled some vulnerabilities, which they called the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities. Uh, and they found them in a very old uh, TCP IP software library, which was originally released in 1997 and has been used in hundreds of millions of devices since then. Everything from smart home to power grids to healthcare equipment to transportation and so on. Um, now, the original company has fixed them 
in its software. But the task now is how do we update all of those devices? We don't even know where they are or what it's installed in. We, we just have no idea because there is no central registry for most of them where we know that the device exists and we know what software it's got in it. Uh, and so there's a real problem that there are many, many devices, many millions of devices that may not be updated just because we don't know about them. Now, security is the base case for an identity system, but actually it goes well beyond that. So if you've got the task of installing a thousand sensors over the next couple of days around your campus or so on, um, it's very time consuming and error prone to do that manually. It's much better to have an automated system, an ID is central to that. It can also become complex. If you're looking at a connected component, say in a car, it may be built in one country and tested there, shipped to another country for building into a, a bigger subsystem and tested there, shipped to a third country to be built into the car and tested there, and then shipped to the customer in a fourth country and tested and made live there. That's all really hard to do if you don't have a good identity system going on behind the scenes. Um, and then once we know what devices are connected, we can start to look at what state they're in, what status they have, what's the software build, what algorithms they're running, and so on. Lots and lots of metadata that goes on around them. Uh, and that might accumulate along a supply chain, several people involved and so on. It could all become quite complicated, especially where there are compliance requirements as well, you know, medical fridges and things like that. And, and that's where we head into digital twins. So what we're saying here is that there's a base case around security and just knowing what you have, but it very quickly adds layers on, become a much more useful thing, which is heading in the direction of digital twins. So it's a very complex area and not very widely understood. And I suppose a lot of the industry is coming from a more a personal identity angle, which is better documented, better understood, and lots of steps being taken to, uh, to do that. So I think what you said so far, Martin, it's clear that things have very different requirements in terms of identity to people. Mm -hmm. But I think there are quite a few similarities. One is that security is absolutely sort of foundational. Second one is that you can get to you know, quite a useful thing with a simple ID, which is you know, not much data. It's a bit like a personal passport or a national insurance number, something like that. Um, but actually, overall, identity is a much more complicated thing. You know, a person's identity isn't just their passport. There's a lot more going on. Uh, and similarly to people, identity theft of things it could become a really big deal in future. We're not quite there yet, but you can see it coming. Um, but I, I think one of the key differences is that with things, somebody always owns the thing. And so you don't have privacy as such an issue uh, for, for the thing itself and for ID. You may have privacy for some of the data it generates, but the thing itself is owned by somebody and the ID is a bit simpler than for people. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd say from the work we've done so far that identity of things isn't very widely understood. Um, the ecosystem needs to start thinking about it more deeply. Uh, you know, chief digital officers need to have it as a consideration. Uh, so what, what do you think the ecosystem needs to know? Well, well, I think that the first step is to have a good grasp of, of you know, even how to think about identity. I, I always think there's a good, um, a good parallel, if you like, with Microsoft Active Directory and Office Graph, which are bundled in with some of the Microsoft services. Now, you, you can't start to use those in a broader sense until everything has an ID on the system, and you can start to assemble those and look at the, the relationships between things. Once that ID is in place and centrally managed, then you can build a number of really useful services on top. And those two things are now absolutely central to the way that Microsoft does so much of what it does around the IT world. And what we're talking about here is a, a parallel, if you like, the, the things graph that we're moving towards in the internet 
thing as well. But that's a that's a kind of IT analogy being brought to it. I mean, Andrew, you probably have a, a meth flavored version of that, don't you, in how you think about it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, I think you know the, the the core belief so far that's coming out of the what we've done in identity is that corporate networks definitely need to evolve to encompass the identity of things. They've you know very much come from a, an IT background, and I would say that the same sort of rules don't apply. And the importance of connecting things is very evident. And this need is forever growing as more things are connected outside enterprise uh, boundaries. And you know, as you gave examples, these, these things can come from such a wide range of yeah. areas. Mm-hmm. Automotive being an interesting one, telematics. You know, we're, we're, we're here you know, talk of drinks cans, having identity, clothing having identity, medication down to individual pills have uh, identities and it's a vast amount of things that require secure connectivity and it's certainly challenging to uh, chief information officers as it stands and you know, we, we believe that they really do need to increase their understanding of identity of things and become adept at allowing, permitting, granting permission, authenticating a vast amount of, of these things onto, uh, onto their enterprise networks. So we're seeing very much uh, that organizations will need to offer high volume identity solutions. You've you talked a little bit about some of the applications, but do you see any particular applications that require a massive amount in terms of volumes of connections, you know, such as Smart cities, for example. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, just to pick up on your, your previous point about CISOs and, and how they need to be more uh, better informed, I think one of the key differences with IoT is that, you know, with IT, if somebody hacks into a laptop or you lose your laptop, yes, you can lose a lot of valuable corporate information and that's bad. But if someone hacks into an autonomous vehicle or a production robot or something like that, you can actually kill people uh, and that sort of physical harm uh, and the leak of you know potentially operational very sensitive data makes it a a whole different thing so partly you need a much tighter grip on the security partly the volumes and the nature of the data you're dealing with is is very different and i I think yes you're right so smart cities things like all the street lights in the city um, add up very quickly to very large volumes we're also seeing on things like wind farms that they use thousands of sensors across a a whole wind farm that the volumes are very large indeed and you know the whole site has to be secured and you need to know that's in place yeah yeah definitely and i I think what one thing that we're seeing is that traditional platforms for identity and access management aren't likely to be fit for purpose moving forward and this is a key consideration that enterprise security teams will have to look at particularly if we're looking at those very sensitive applications and we've heard stories of hacks of some of the vehicle companies yeah and no i we definitely see identity as a building block in unlocking the iot solutions market and it, it's a, a complex and challenging area deploying at such scale and you know these platforms if they're not updated and fit for purpose, are going to stifle the the growth of IoT and render these devices, uh, not allow them to perform properly on their network. Um, That's right. And I think um, there are a lot of organisations who've installed device management systems for their IT and have got that side very well organised. And there's a sort of natural inclination to want to use all of that when it comes to operational technology there. And as you've mentioned, there are some technical aspects why that may not work. Um, But I think there's also quite a lot to do with organizational aspects there. You know, can the relevant people get access to this system in the way that they need? Can they set it up to give them the data they need? And can they make changes easily? Can they use it, you know, as an operational tool rather than just an IT admin tool? And I think those aspects 
compound with the technical issues and probably mean that we're going to need a whole different area of identity systems. No, I, I'd thoroughly ag agree with those points. I mean, we've seen from experiences with IoT security that enterprises are definitely having to rethink their approach and recognise that they don't necessarily have the skill sets in-house to address these new challenges, new threats that are, are coming on board. And I, I think it's very much the same with identity. And that, that kind of brings me on to, you know, just, just what is the scope of an identity solution? And, you know, some, some of the thinking around this is that identity of things platforms will need to be flexible, agile, and scalable. And enterprise is going to need to capitalize on the business benefits of IoT solutions and move from very much what I see as a defensive mode at the moment to embracing these devices, these sensors, these things, that are outside the boundaries of the traditional enterprise network. And there has to be some definite progress from permitting and denying access to systems to actively managing a high volume of things connecting to a corporate network with identity and access management becoming a key consideration that the IoT enterprise security team needs to address. I don't know whether you have a, a particular flavor of the, the scope of one of these? Well, I, I think you've just you know, very articulately put the complexities of it. I, I tend to think of it as something that exists in several layers. You, you could just have a very simple ID somewhere on your network that other systems tap into, or you can go somewhat beyond that with layers of metadata, which take you all the way up to and kind of include the digital twins. I think the important thing is, or one important thing is, that that system in the network completely relies on linking to a secure element in the device, so that there's a sort of pairing between the device and what goes on in the network. Uh, and we need to think of it as a system. And you need, however you organize those layers, whether they're all in one system or, or APIs between different systems, doesn't really matter. But all devices that you use have to be compatible with the system in order to get the value out of it. And I think that's going to be a challenging element as we do this. Yeah, we, we kind of have been looking at this and we, we see there are really four main requirements that are coming out for, if we're calling it an IEO, identity of things platform of the future. So first of all, your modularity is important. So this the best way of ensuring the, the complexity of many users, device access points and characteristics are all properly managed. And the second aspect that organizations need to think about is scalability, so they can manage this exponential growth of, of things that are going to be assaulting their networks. And they need to be flexible in responding to constant fluctuation in the volume of these things. I think a third aspect is that these things don't have borders. Um, your, your automotive example was a good one where it could be manufactured in one country, sold in another, and then traveling to several others beyond that. Yeah. And an IoT platform is an anytime, anywhere connection and secure access needs to be happening under these conditions. Yes. And I think finally, they have to be sensitive to context to allow real-time access from a number of non-standard devices or, or sites. Yes. I just wanted to pause there and throw the ball back to you, Martin. And you've done a bit of thinking around device management system, and it's probably not clear at the moment what these systems are doing and what they need to do and how they're managed. I wonder if you have some thoughts on that. Well, yeah, and, and we've touched on some of that, that the technical aspects for IoT are different from IT. And so probably there are two worlds and, and we won't see a whole lot of crossover between those two worlds, even though some suppliers would like that to be the case. Um, but as I mentioned, I don't think it's only going to come down to technical features. I think you know a lot of it is around the organization. Often the, the operational staff in, in say the factory or the plant or whatever it is, are very different, different budgets, different, you know, even different parts of the network and so on. Very different from the IT guys. And a lot of it has to do with the interfaces there and how those work. Um, 
I, th I think another part of it is that you know actually ID often isn't built into um, IoT systems. You you kind of have to add it in or have it as part of your IoT platform. It has to be specified and used separately. And so you then end up with compatibility issues across, you know, if you decide to do a new project, well, is it compatible with the platform we already use? And you know, yeah. a lot of issues there. I, in, in many ways, that's one way in which, say, Microsoft with its um, if they has a real advantage because the office suite is so universal across the enterprise world that they can kind of assume it will be there. Uh, that's much less true in the operations world, uh, which tends to be very fragmented, millions of different types of machines and so on. That complexity is really hard to deal with. Yeah, um, another observation that's been made and particularly around things like smart cities are that governments or local governments tend to operate in silos and i think this can be true for enterprises as well yep. and the elusive promise of digital transformation but there's a lot of practical organizational hurdles that need to be overcome before an organization can often embrace these sort of more advanced solutions yes exactly and we hear it with not just with smart cities that's a really good example but also with things like smart buildings where the landlord owns the building, somebody else might have the management responsibility for the building and may commission you know, maintenance and technology upgrades within the building. And then they let it out to say 10 different companies who use the offices. Who takes responsibility under those conditions for the identity of the things in those offices? Um, those, that organizational driver is, is going to be hard to work through, but I think we have to do it because it's a really important side as we do more and more with IoT. Yeah, well, I think to achieve those benefits, that, that really needs to happen. Yeah. So a kind of bit of an open question to discuss. Where do you see the, the key opportunities for suppliers coming into these markets and, and perhaps for enterprises looking to deploy identity? Well, you know, Lots of analysts like to say, well, there'll be 50 billion connected things by 2030 and what have you. Uh, and it's very easy to say that all connected things need an identity. And so there's a truly enormous opportunity. Actually, we don't really buy that view. We think that all the while that ID is not built into a lot of the systems, it's going to be a sort of a long and quite complicated task to build it up as a proper layer within the systems that we're installing uh, and we'll only get to real volumes when it's sort of built into the things that you buy um, and that could be because the customer owns the system and everything that goes on it or it could be that you buy just a point solution you know like a fever screening camera for the front of your yeah. supermarket or something like that um, and you don't have a complex IoT system behind it but the supplier takes care of the ID you know, so there are several ways to set it up, but we think that sort of approach where it's built in is absolutely essential to realize the volumes. Um, another key opportunity is that there are quite a few proprietary systems in existence from people who run the big platforms, you know, Siemens, MindSphere, Qualcomm has one, Microsoft has one, Intel put their system together with ARM and so on. What we don't have though at the moment is a large open source initiative in this area and the open source movement in IoT is really strong and we kind of think we need a good open source option here in this ID world and I haven't seen it yet. No, no, um, it's interesting you mentioned Intel and ARM. Um, I was just going to ask as the, the next sort of area, who do you see as the organisations on the supply side that are real movers and shakers in this market? Well, yeah, I, I think we just mentioned, uh, you know, a few of them. I think there's a lot of interest from people in the blockchain world to put blockchain forward as another option for doing this, where each thing would have an account on the blockchain or a sub account, uh, and that would be the bottom layer of the ID, and then the uh, the other information stored in the blockchain would be the metadata that, that layers on top of it. Um, so I think there are kind of probably several technology options. I think one thing, and you touched on this early on, is zero touch onboarding linked to yes. um, ID. 
And, and this is a really clever thing. So this is the idea of this is where you set up a new device, you power it on, it pings the server, verifies with the server that it is who it says it is, then it downloads the appropriate version of the software and gets going automatically on the network. Now, if you're installing several hundred things this afternoon across your factory, you need a lot of automation to make that go. And so the security and the ID has to be firmly built into that system uh, to make that a, a good approach, I think. No, I think, you know, as we're talking about zero touch onboarding, I think it's a good example of where the ecosystem is starting to collaborate more. And like, as you say, if you, once you move away from proprietary to more open source type approaches, then things tend to happen more rapidly, markets develop more rapidly. And you know, zero touch onboarding is, is a good example of something positive that's happened. And you know, I would say, Manual processes have many challenges. The amount of time it can take to uh, update, change out accessory devices. You know, if you're a vending machine company with a thousand vending machines, and each vending machine takes twenty minutes to change or update, uh, it's 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 a long and costly costly affair. And uh, and you're going to make mistakes with the passwords, and the, you know, any manual steps trip, will trip you up in doing that. Yeah, and people are definitely looking for something that's rapid, flexible, and secure if we're going to hit these these sorts of projections. Um, and I, I think it's very positive that those two organizations are, are working together. And uh, yeah, one of the things I liked about that was that, you know, although there are a lot of proprietary systems, two of the leading sort of chip architecture companies realized that that wouldn't be a point of differentiation. You know, we all need identity, but, but that's not why you buy an IoT system. And so it's not a valid point of differentiation. So I thought it was quite an enlightened move to put their two systems together and make one you know, really large, uh, very scalable system from it. Uh, I thought that was a, a clever move. Yeah, no, there's, in fact, there's a quote by Intel that says, we may not realize the business benefits of IoT unless there is collaboration in the industry to offer more open and scalable methods to secure the provision devices and their data to the cloud. And I think that kind of sums it up very nicely. And you know, achieving the business benefits of reducing the cost of employment, increasing security, easing in-life management and flexibility, and leveraging the data. And mm. flexibility is inherent in this... Uh, zero touch onboarding process where the device is preloaded, configured with identity and, uh, and customer credentials in the factory. So yeah, we definitely see that um, the business benefits and return on investment are going to be achieved far more rapidly with significantly less complexity and greater flexibility over the choice of data and cloud platform providers. So moving on from zero touch onboarding, I wanted to come on to the issue of digital twins and the role they have to play in OT. So I, I wondered if you could give us uh, your view on uh, first what digital twins are and the role they have to play in, in identity and IoT. Well, yeah, no, thank you. Very, very interesting area. And I, and I think digital twins are becoming a key concept in IoT. And they can be just fairly simple things. They can be a, a sort of metadata file uh, on the build state, the software version, the configuration parameters and so on of each thing. Or they can be a more complicated thing, you know, a full operating model of an entire system. And we saw a couple of weeks ago at Microsoft Build, they announced an expansion of their digital twin system so that they can now model entire power grids for a country for example, that's a really big deal. Um, and we tend to think of digital twins as, as the slightly sort of flashy map of the factory on the boardroom wall in a German company type setup. And, and that bit is true, uh, but there are lots of sort of regular, more routine day-to-day -day uses. So you can use them to test a new version of the software on a modeled device before downloading it to the real 
device. And that way, if there are any problems, you find them first before you affect production you know, properly in the factory. You can also test new machine learning algorithms before you download those. You can use them to organize sort of permissions and if you like contracts between parts of systems for passing data to and from uh, as part of the IoT system. And, and they then form a key element of, of if you like, the, the things graph that you're building up, which is very similar to the office graph that we mentioned before. And I, I think it's quite interesting that um, also a couple of weeks ago, there was a new consortium formed, the Digital Twin Consortium, and their whole aim was to take a messy proprietary market and make it much more accessible, much more standardized, much more open, and to make it part of the mainstream of IoT. And they really seem to have hit a nerve. So they've got, I think, 56 members in the first 10 days, which is wow. a rapid rate of adoption. And you know, their mission is to make all of this much more open and mainstream from here on. Yeah, yeah, very interesting observation there. I, I know we've we've reached our half an hour of discussion, so we've had a couple of questions in. So I just wanted to go through those questions. And, and the first question that's been asked is: Do you think it's possible to have a global identity of things that works for all kinds of things? I suspect it's a lovely idea, um, but then you know if we had one, who would control it is quite an important question. Now we do have some of this with the way that the internet runs. There are some sort of global organisations there, but you know if the Americans ran it, would the Chinese be happy using it and so on? You know, there are lots of um, geopolitical issues that work against that, and also. If you are a company and you absolutely depend on these things for your operations, then I think you probably want to have control of that yourself. So I don't think we're going towards a global thing. I think it's going to be company by company, maybe country by country uh, in some cases, um, but I think it will be more fragmented than global. What we might have is global standards and approaches for doing it, uh, and that would be progress. Yeah, well, that kind of neatly goes into the second question is, do we see a need for a global identity architecture? Uh, I, I think that would be a good idea. I'm sure there are variations. I'm sure that the way that, say, the automotive industry uses it is not maybe the same as the oil and gas industry uses it. So there may need to be some, if you like, flavours for different sector specific things. Um, but I think an overall architecture, and I actually think one of the one of the things that the Digital Twin Consortium could, you know, really usefully do is produce that. So it's a sort of top to bottom view that if you only do layer one, this is what you do. If you do layers one to three, it contains these things and so on. I think that would be a fantastic output to help the world forwards in this. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, a couple of other questions I'd like to cover off. It's, I suppose, who is taking the lead in this area? Um, and you know, people coming from a connectivity background you know, say that communication service providers don't seem to have a handle on the identity of things. So what do they need to do about it? And I've only seen perhaps a couple of them that have, have actually stuck their neck out and said, you know, we're doing something about identity. Yeah, and I think uh, I would agree with you. I think generally speaking, the, the communication service providers, they're in a good position, but they maybe haven't done enough yet. I think they tend to think of a database of SIM cards or SIM IDs as all you need for an identity system. Uh, and there is value in that, of course there is, but it tends to focus more on the connectivity. Whereas one of the key things we've discussed is that there are many more layers than that. And if you only focus on the connectivity, you, you're focusing more on the ID than on the, the system elements of the ID system. And I, so I think they need to think more widely, maybe come up the stack a few layers, look at the, the wider picture of what digital twins can do and you know, work towards a bigger picture here. Yeah, sounds very wise advice. I think the next question you've covered a little bit and that's, is the market for identity and access management for things large? 
I'm sure you'll have views on this too, but, but I don't think there really is a market for identity solutions, not a separate market. I think typically ID will need to be bought as part of other things. So you may have a, a system. I suppose there will be a market for very large companies who do a bunch of different things and they need to bring all of those together in one place. They may choose to buy a separate system. But, but if you're a, you know, a small shop or a restaurant or you know, a shopping mall operating on your own, that sort of thing, typically you're not going to do that. And so the ID will need to be wrapped in with the products and services that you buy and i think that's probably the more common aspect of it so i don't think the market for id on its own in internet of things is, is large at all no i i just i'd have to agree with you i'd see that it's some kind of service bundling along with uh, another kind of and and similarly for blockchain it's very easy to turn up you know make a lot of noise about your blockchain but kind of misses the point uh, it, You've got to bundle it in and the ID is the service, not the blockchain. That's a technology. Yeah, and it wouldn't be fitting in this sort of environment without asking, do you see any impact from COVID-19 on, uh, on the identity or the evolution of the identity market? It's interesting, isn't it? I think you know, although we are seeing some increased demand for some types of IoT system, that actually, paradoxically, I think this outbreak could make the ID market more difficult. Uh, and the reason is that people are making a lot of purchase decisions in quite a hurry at the moment, and they're tending to focus on point products that you can buy today, install tomorrow, and then use them the next day. Um, and many of those just don't have ID as a, as a core component. We, we've heard of, I think, 145 fever screening camera manufacturers in right. parts of the globe and what have you. And they're just sold as you know, a camera with a red light or a green light, depending on what the result is. There's no ID there at all. And the problem will be that a lot of companies, after buying these products and getting their workplace safe again, they'll go into business recovery mode where they're really worried about building their revenue back up, building their profit back up, and they're not going to have a lot of money for investing in things like ID solutions, even if they realize they need them. The money's yeah. not going to be there for a while. So I think it's going to take sort of two or three years to build back up before we can really kind of go back to the architectural part of this and say, now, now we need ID and we need to stitch this all together and do it properly. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly from what's happening in the IoT market generally, that a, a lot of projects seem to have either gone on the back burner for a little while. Um, but I do anticipate they will recover um, oh, yes. at some point. And uh, I think things will, you know, the revenues will take a short to medium term dip. We probably won't have the same growth rates we're having, but I think organizations are definitely seeing a need for IoT solutions, enabling digital transformation, etc., will, will definitely be motivated. Oh yeah, I'm sure it will come back. Uh, and in fact, some of the purchase decisions we, we're seeing being made now will need to be rethought in a year or so's time. So actually, there may be some opportunities, you know, with rework as people, you know, swap stuff out for properly architected systems and so on. Yeah. Oh, I have just one final question that's that's just come in, and that is, is identity driven by device basis or the application it's being used for? And is there any international agency to manage this, like the ITU for the telecoms industry? I think you partially answered that already. I, I think, yeah, we touched on the, you know, is there a grand management system? I tend to think not. Uh, although I think, you know, maybe the ITU or somebody like that could publish standards that help us all understand how to do this. I think the installations and the systems will be more fragmented than that. Um, I don't think it's either device-based or application-based. I think there's a sort of system level view and the system will have many different types of devices, many different types of applications. Um, and But I think it's more to do with the system than any one aspect of it. Yep, sorry, there is one final question when you uh, thought you could start to relax. Um, and the question is, do you think governments would ever be likely to put digital IDs 
uh, of things into law. Um, you know, for example, drones registered in the USA, but it all seems to be very offline. Will it ever be more digital? Well, I, I, that's a really interesting question, and I could absolutely see with drones, especially if we go more towards drone deliveries for Amazon parcels and things like that, we're going to need a kind of air traffic control for drones, a proper version of that. Uh, and then we need to know, you know, each drone will need a number and they all need to live in a big centrally registered database and so on. I think we could also see it with critical infrastructure like trains, um, power grid elements and so on. You know, I think there's going to be a lot around critical infrastructure that we, as we build this up in a connected way, governments are going to get very interested in how, you know, secure and hackable it, it is. And they're yeah. going to want to know how all of this is managed. So I, I think that's a, that's a very interesting question. So there will be laws or sector specific compliance requirements that apply here. And uh, yeah, good question. Yeah. Okay, well, we're, we're coming to the end of our time now. So I just wanted to ask you finally, Martin, do you have any key messages, any key takeaways, what the most important things around identity of things are? Well, yes, I, I thought about this. You, you warned me up for this question, Andrew, and I thought about it. So uh, I would say, first of all, make sure you, you know, if you're installing an IoT system, make sure you have a grip on device ID for any equipment you set up. Uh, and everything you connect should have an entry in a device registry of some kind. That could be a system you run, or it could be done by the supplier. That bit doesn't matter so much, but, but have an ID. Second one is, think ahead don't just do the smallest cheapest thing you can to get it working because i and i hope we've discussed this enough i think this is going to become strategic and it could be a cornerstone of your iot security and of any digital twins that you run and it may feel a bit abstract and remote today but i think in five years time it's going to be a key part of the things that we all do with iot uh, and then the last bit is please, please don't build your own ID system. <laughs> it's a really bad idea because it's just plumbing. And some suppliers have already built them and they've probably done a better job and a more scalable job than any of us could do ourselves. Um, and so you won't get a scalable system and you'll spend a fortune maintaining it and you'll have the task of getting other people to be interoperable and compliant and so on. So please don't build your own system. Just use one of the existing ones because there are some good ones out there. Thank you, Martin. I think there are a lot of lessons learned from IT deployments of the past that will, will come back into application now. So I'd, I'd like to thank people for listening to us today and a, a big thank you to Martin of CCS Insight for joining us and providing us with the, his depth of views in, in this area. As I said, the webinar will be recorded and made available and there will be a write-up of the event. And if you have questions for Martin or myself, you know, please do contact us and we can answer those in due course. So thank you everyone. It's, it's been a pleasure having you to the Identity of Things webinar. Thank you, Martin, and goodbye. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you.